Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more to us about the future of the labor movement, what sort of threats you expect and what, what the hope is for the future of the labor movement. It's a big question. Um, the problem in the labor movement today is that we are completely on the defensive. Uh, and we have been that for more than 30 years now. Um, and it is, uh, the future will be a result of the ongoing struggles because there is a class war going on for the time being. The tra uh, trade unions and labor movement uh, is under attack from uh, uh, governments, from uh, employers and so on. And they are changing the labor laws in Europe. They are limiting the right to strike and so on. So it is an enormous oppressive situation for the, for the labor movement. And one of the problems we, we feel in the labor movement, in the trade union movement, is the uh, political and ideological crisis on the left. Mm -hmm. Because they do not have a, 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 a real answer in the con con current situation. And they are too influenced by this post-war class cooperation situation, with the class compromise, which was the basis for the cooperation in the post-war period. And that created a sort of a, a ideology that it was possible to move forward by uh, discussing and having the social dialogue with the employers and so on. And that system has broken down because the, the uh, employers have withdrawn from this compromise, then they are not attacking. So I think one of the important things in the labor movement is to um, sort of break with this uh, the social partnership ideology and realize that they are in a situation of class war. Um, so wh why do you think that the labor movement has had difficulty um, in criticizing the system? No, it's exactly what I said. They had a period of 20, 30 years in which they improved the situation for workers and ordinary people enormously. And I think that, that created a new understanding that it was possible to make progress without all this struggle. It is not funny to have a strike or a long time struggle or to fight on the streets and so on. So it's not something you do because it's funny. You do it because you're pushed into a situation and have to do it. And the problem now is that that has not been uh, understood completely by the entire labor movement. They still think that they, this is a sort of intermediate, intermediary period and they will come back to again like it was in the 1960s. I think at least the, the elder generation in the labor movement are influenced by that. But we also see that the young people are uh, coming up with new ideas and new understanding now. So there is a possibility that this will change, I think. But the, the problem is that in the meantime, we can lose a lot of members. Pe people can be sort of uh, demoralized in the current situation. and and don't see the trade unions as their instrument at all. We see tendencies to that. For example, in, in Spain, we have seen a lot of that over the last 10 years. To what extent do you think that the welfare state was able to build resiliency in Norway during the financial crisis? An interesting thing is that the, um, the Nordic countries, even though also in Norway, the, and the Nordic countries, the welfare state has been under pressure and under attack. It is still the biggest welfare state in Western Europe and in the world, I think. And it, it is uh, very interesting then to, to notice that the financial crisis, crisis has less, had less influence, less negative influence in those countries than in, in the countries in which they have uh, reduced the welfare state considerably. So to have a strong public sector, strong welfare state, actually stabilized the economy and reduced the effects of the financial crisis. That's a fact, and many people point on that fact now, but not before it happened, because then uh, the neoliberal policy uh, had it that uh, the welfare state was a problem of the economy. It proved to be the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the, that the rhetoric of the austerity movement is to break the welfare state. Can you talk a little bit more about 
the the aims or falsifications, I guess, of the austerity idea. Yeah, you know, the the problem is that those who uh, introduce the austerity measures say it is in order to defend and save the welfare state for future generations. We have to cut now in order to 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 to, to prevent that it's getting too big and destroy the economy. So they are saying the opposite of what they are doing in one way. Because my view and my analysis is quite clear that what they are doing now is not to reduce the costs of the welfare state in order to save it. They use the crisis as an opportunity to destroy the welfare state. They are never liked it. And the employers, the capitalist forces, has never liked the welfare state. For them, it, it was a, a defeat in the post-war period when they had to give in to a lot of these demands because they had to do it because the labor movement was very strong and radical. So uh, the austerity policy is, is not, not implemented. It's a revenge going on. It's a revenge. They are going to get back everything which they lost in the post-war period. Okay, so in the Alberta context, you mentioned that the crisis was uh, an opportunity to disarm financial capital and regulate the market. Do you see that uh, our current situation in Alberta with the drop in oil prices as a similar opportunity for us here? Of course, but the, the opportunity is for the, the movements, for, for, the, for the campaigns from below in order to take this uh, opportunity. And I think that Exactly the, the, the reduction of oil prices is an opportunity to reorient the economy, to focus on the renewable energy and to start this necessary the transformation of the economy which we have to do if we want our sons and daughters to be able to live on this planet.